History has illustrated Jane Seymour as a devoted and peaceful lady. Yet her reason for marriage is not what you think. She entered court and gained favour from a king whose life was in turmoil, but he was also a king who lacked so much integrity. So was Jane's involvement with Henry a blessing or a curse? And what's the truth behind this lovable woman? Join me now as we take a look at the life of Jane Seymour. Jane was the daughter of Sir John Seymour and Marjorie Wentworth. She was most likely born at Wolf Hall in Wiltshire, although West Bower Manor in Somerset has also been suggested. It's not known when she was born, but it's been estimated sometime between 1504 and 1509. Jane's family held a respectable lineage. Her father was Sir John. He had served in the Tournay campaign of 1513 and also accompanied Henry VIII to the Field of the Cloth of Gold in 1520. His favour was rewarded by Henry when he firstly made him a knight and then a gentleman of the King's bedchamber. These were both highly sought after positions which included personal access to the King. You see, courtiers and Henry's fan club were always monitoring the situation and looking for any way to reach out and speak to Henry. But John held the reins for now and his prominence grew, along with the rest of the Seymour family. The Seymour family rise to prominence at Henry's court was very similar to that of the Boleyns, and a route to power attempted by many families looking for the door into the inner sanctuary, while holding on tightly to their minor pedigree, which on the surface sounds like a decent plan. It was one thing to be at court, yet it was a completely different story when it came to gaining favour from the king himself. Though it seems the Seymours were by far the more astute in this field than their predecessors. Jane first arrived at court as lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife. But soon enough, Anne Boleyn was queen, and so Jane attended her. Jane was considered to be a quiet lady, meek and very mild, yet she would witness a battle of the sexes between Henry and Anne. Although remaining calm and impartial, it must have been quite daunting for Jane seeing the two powerhouses competing as they did with each other. It's factual that Henry knew of her, but little is known as to whether he actually noticed her. This changed in September 1535. On one of his royal progresses through the country, he stopped over at Wolf Hall. For the Seymours, this was a massive occasion. It wasn't every day of the week your employer and king would pop round for a chat, maybe a bite to eat and a few drinks. The honour of having his majesty at their home would be memorable for one particular event. It was when Henry really first set his eyes on Jane. He saw a woman of the utmost charm in both character and appearance. As for Henry, well, he was hooked. Maybe the word infatuation is a little stronger term at this point, but knowing Henry flicking at his little black book, I imagine he penciled in Jane for a future date. The big problem for Henry was his marriage to Anne, and although this was waning and every day he grew more concerned, yet Anne still had an opportunity to resurrect her marriage. She was, after all, pregnant. Henry kept himself occupied once back at court, even though his wife was nearing childbirth, he still found time to woo and become flirtatious with Anne's cousin, a Madge Shelton. As for Jane, well, for now she was completely out of sight and mind for Henry. In 1536, whispers and rumour began to circulate throughout court. Speculation was always rife, but it seems now Jane was becoming a clear favourite to land the throne, still occupied by Anne Boleyn. As the plot thickened, it was Henry who now made some forwarding gestures to Jane. And these were obviously spotted by people within the inner circle. Foreign ambassadors were reporting on the rumours, and over time it would become clear that the king certainly had an affection towards Jane. Gifts began to arrive at her door. However, she made haste in returning them. You could say a prudent move on her part, but we all know what Henry is like when he gets a move on. Yet it didn't stop there. Her brothers who were also moving into the king's top 10 chart of prominence and both would receive promotions at court. Edward Seymour and his wife were moved to rooms which connected directly to the king's own rooms via a secret passage. Henry's thoughts were to continue to court Jane, but this time in a more private capacity. 
Henry was fully aware of the public outrage which he witnessed at his open relationship with Anne while still being married to Catherine of Aragon and he knew he had to keep the people on his side this time around. I mean, there's only so much scandal a family can take. Well, maybe not in Henry's case. Discretion continued and to some extent this suited Jane. She was more than content to remain a hidden subject and face the wrath of courtiers. It was suggested that Jane would dine alone with Henry, but she always insisted that this was purely a platonic friendship and her charge was nothing more than being a friend. It's also said that she reminded the king of his current marriage. Oh, to be a fly on the wall for that. Although Henry knew his previous activities did nothing for his appearance to a wider audience, his second marriage had become stale. His goal now was to remove Anne Boleyn from his life and replace her with Jane. It was all the impetus he needed to take such drastic action. But sad news followed on the 7th of January 1536 when it was announced that Catherine of Aragon had passed away. The news quickly spread throughout Europe and across England and people were devastated and had always regarded Catherine as the king's true wife and his second bride Anne as nothing more than a mistress. On the 29th of January Anne miscarried her son. The king with a heartfelt declaration said he would have no more children by her. Hardly the type of words you'd think a caring husband would offer to his wife at such an awful time. But this is no caring husband. This is Henry. Henry now sets out plans to remove Anne as queen. He knew by hook or by crook that she must be ejected from society. Get this right and marry Jane. He would have at last a legitimate marriage that people approved of, but also the possibility of having the one thing he always desired, a son. Henry started to talk openly, describing his marriage to Anne as being bewitched. Knowing his words would be heard by Anne, she found herself in a terrifying position, but there was little she could do to stop the spread or wagging of tongues at court. Anne had made very few friends while she was with Henry, and the ones she did make were now slowly moving away from her back to the warm and charismatic king. It would be on May the 2nd that Anne was arrested and taken to the Tower of London. On the 15th of May she had been condemned to death. Henry, being the good chap he was, thought it would be proper to send a personal message to Jane with the news. I'm sure she was thrilled. Four days later Anne was executed and the following day the king had been formally betrothed to Jane. They were married at the Palace of Whitehall in London in the Queen's Closet by Bishop Gordon on the 30th of May 1536. As a wedding gift, Henry granted her 104 manors in four counties, as well as a number of forests and hunting chases. She was then publicly declared queen on June the 4th. Jane at least let Henry know exactly how she would get by during their relationship with an apt motto of bound to obey and serve. Yet her well publicized sympathy for the late Queen Catherine and her daughter Mary showed her to be compassionate. This made her a popular figure with common people and most of the courtiers. Jane never had the grand and extremely lavish ceremony which Anne had received. And to be fair, it was in the heat of the summer months and some minor plagues were sweeping through London. Henry announced it would be the following year in spring that she would be crowned. But the gossips again were already talking this move up, saying Henry really had no intention of placing the crown on Jane's head unless and this was a big if in terms of Henry's success rate, if Jane could provide Henry with a son. If not, it would be a simple process to annul the marriage and move on. Once again, whether these rumours were true or not, it gives an impression Henry was already plotting a future campaign. By now, almost 10 years had passed since the King's great matter first began, and still Henry had no male heir. More bad news was to follow when on the 20th of July 1536 Henry received news that his only illegitimate son Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond, had passed away at the age of 17. Henry was now left with two daughters, both themselves illegitimate. Jane's position was precarious. If she could provide Henry with a son, all would be well. If not, she would most likely face the same treatment as previous, as in being discarded. For now, Henry's only interest was to place his political necessity over anything personal. 
Jane, however, was able to give the one thing that Henry most craved, and indeed the whole country was behind her on this one, a male heir. The people had no desires to go in back into a time of civil war. Henry knew that, but he was literally in the hands of God on this occasion. As usual, rumours began almost immediately after their marriage that Jane was pregnant, and this was confirmed at Christmas in 1536, but she lost the child. Then in January 1537, Jane conceived again, and this was later confirmed upon the first sighting of the maternal bump. The London chronicler at the time was Edward Hall, and he recorded that the public were rejoicing at this latest news. On the 27th of May 1537, Hall said, There was a Te Deum sung in St Paul's Cathedral for joy at the Queen's quickening of her child. My Lord Chancellor, Lord Privy Seal and various other lords and bishops being then present. The mayor and aldermen with the best guilds of the city being there in their liveries, all giving Lord and praise to God for joy about it. It was during her pregnancy, like most ladies, Jane got cravings. Nothing too weird, but she developed a liking for quail. Now of course Henry being a man that would do anything in his quest for an heir, dispatched an order for her, which duly arrived from Calais and Flanders. As the months rolled by, Jane took no public engagements and led a relatively quiet life, attended only by the royal physicians and the best midwives in the kingdom. It would be a time of celebration. Bonfires were lit throughout the land, prayers offered for the safe delivery and for Jane, who remained at Hampton Court in preparation for the big day. The birth occurred on the 12th of October. Jane had suffered throughout with difficult labour, yet she gave birth to a son. You can't even imagine how exuberant Henry was at this news. On the 15th of October, the eve of St Edward's Day, the baby boy was baptised and named after the day, Edward. His two half-sisters attended, and Mary was godmother and Elizabeth was carried in the arms of Thomas Seymour. Thomas Boleyn also attended, quite possibly under duress, rather than a need to be present. It had taken 29 years for Henry to finally be granted the one and only wish he had ever wanted, that of a male heir. For now, Henry could be happy and his past exploits forgotten. It had been a long, rocky road to this point in his life, and surely things could only now get better for the monarch. Unfortunately for Jane's success was short-lived. She was very weak from the labour and birth. Yet wrapped in robes, she was carried to the King's Chapel where the christening took place. Exhausted and very poorly, the only thing she needed now was peace and quiet, along with time to recuperate from her exertions. A day later, things took a turn for the worse. It was reported that the Queen was now gravely ill and her condition was worsening. Attempts were made to bring down a high temperature, but her fever persisted. The doctors had bled her and her other attendants were helping with her craving for fruit and wine, quite possibly not the best solution. Today most historians believe that Jane has suffered with either puerperal sepsis or childbed fever, both common ailments in the 16th century. Jane died on the 24th of October, close to midnight. It's a very sad case. Jane was clearly a victim of the times, with poor hygiene and a lack of medical knowledge which could not halt the fever which had escalated so very quickly. For Henry, his world ended on that day, from a great triumph to now nothing more than a memory, although Jane would always have an enduring hold over her king, even in death. Her funeral was a state occasion. Princess Mary acted as chief mourner, and Jane was buried on the 12th of November 1537 in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. A procession of 29 mourners followed Mary, one for every year of Jane's life. She was the only one of Henry's wives to receive a Queen's funeral, and after her death Henry wore black for the next three months. It will be two years later that Henry once again married, this time to Anne of Cleves, although it's been suggested that negotiations were underway to have a new Queen soon after Jane's death. During that time Henry piled on excess weight, he became swollen and obese, and he developed diabetes and gout. Henry was quite possibly never the same again after Jane, and when he died in 1547, he was buried beside her on his request in the grave he had made for her. 
Jane was Henry's third wife, but quite possibly the one woman who Henry truly loved. She was the one who gave birth to his son, and her demeanour throughout her life seemed to have a settling effect over the king. He seemed enamoured of her in a way he wasn't with either previous or the wives yet to come. She also played a part in Mary's succession and her father's affections, along with her influence to help advance her own family fortunes. Jane had many qualities that appealed to the ageing king. She was gentle, sweet-natured and subservient. Her lack of need or greed perhaps hit a nerve with Henry, and he respected her in a way different from others. And even in years after her death, although he was married to other women, Jane continued to appear in royal portraits as the Queen Consort. Her special status and mother to the heir was never forgotten. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. For more amazing stories, join me today and benefit by subscribing. And check out both the videos coming up on the screen right now. And I'll see you again soon here on the History Roadshow.